At the end of your life, what will be your legacy? What will you leave behind for future generations? For the world, join the world messenger, Isabella Lundberg, each week as she brings you a new distinguished guest from the business, sports, or entertainment world to share their success, their struggles, and their lessons. They will share their insights into current hot topics that affect everyone. Isabella facilitates an intimate, vulnerable environment to find the true value of humanity and real leadership. Are you ready for your legacy? The legacy that matters? Hello, hello, my beautiful friends. It's Isabella Lumakir, the world messenger, and inviting you for another epic, epic episode of Legacy Leader Show. And this one is absolutely epic. And I am smiling. I'm super jazzed and maybe talking too fast. But guess what, guys? This is one of those moments when you just absolutely want to just sit back and listen and watch and enjoy. It's absolute great pleasure to have someone that I admired, that I've been connected for a while, and I didn't know what he's up to currently, but someone who did amazing stellar career as professional athlete. And you guys know I'm super excited about that. We're having here in studio joining us here from San Francisco, from Bay Area, Raymond Tasson. How are you doing, Raymond? How are you? How are you doing, Isabella? I'm Good. doing fantastic. If people Good. will not know better, they will think that you speak Spanish and that a little bit of the Latino flair is coming. <laughs> oh, I've lived in Italy. I've lived in Barcelona, so I speak Spanish. I speak Portuguese from Brazil, and I speak uh, Italian. So, and oh my, my French, goodness. my French is with an Italian accent. So, oh my God, so all it's those, just all from from travels. All those beautiful romantic languages. Let me tell you, see some athletes. That is phenomenal mindset. Many athletes travel and never learn a language, let alone phrase, right? And you go and you learn all these languages. So we'll get to that point. But for anybody that don't know who you are, uh, and they're exposed because you are a professional athlete you played in nba for over four years and then you transitioned to europe you did something that typically europeans go first play in europe and they come to nba and you reverse that so do you want to share a little bit about your journey how all this started because you i believe you were completely into different sports before you even consider nba well i would say uh a young boy growing up in San Jose, California, and I wanted to be a Yankee. I wanted to wear the pinstripes for pro baseball. My dad played for the Milwaukee Braves, uh, the minor leagues, um, got double A, triple A. And so I wanted to be a Yankee. I always wanted to wear those pinstripes with that blue hat with the NY, live in New York. That was my dream. And uh, played basketball, football, baseball when I was a kid. Uh, happened to be very good, very, very good baseball player and a very good basketball player. Eventually had a great high school career at a really good Catholic school here called Archbishop Mitty. It's nationally renowned for its athletic programs, its academic programs. And I remember uh, after graduating or my senior year, in the middle of my senior year, uh, John Wooden from UCLA called and said he was interested. And uh, everybody at that time, during that time, UCLA was never ranked less than fifth. They just won nine out of 11 national championships, nine out of 11 years, they won the national championship, which is unheard of. And he told me that he'd like to come up and visit and talk about me going to UCLA. And it was kind of a funny visit because we were so excited. We knew who he was. So when they knocked on the door, it's like, it was like scripted. We all looked and we saw him through the, the little peephole. We all went, we all had our places planned. My mom and dad are here, I'm here. My, my four brothers and sisters are all here. And he walked in and his first words were, you know, Raymond, we're, we're interested in you, but we run a program of integrity and honesty. So I wanna be honest with you about UCLA and let you know, you're not my number one pick. <laughs> that was his opening phrase. And so I just kind of thought, and I was thinking nowadays, there's a sense of entitlement with young people, with our young generation. And if you would tell any recruited, high-end recruit that he's not your number one pick, the family would probably kick you out and say, hey, thank you, but you're not, you know, you're, you're probably not for me. I was different. I asked Coach Wood, no, Coach Wood, and who's your number one pick? Mm -hmm. He said, it's a young man from Los Angeles. 
Uh, he's averaging 39 points a game. And you have to understand there was no three-point line when I grew up. So 39 is like 49, 50. And he goes, you're only averaging 29, but we want you. You're my number two pick. And he goes, are you okay with that? And I said, yes, sir, I'm okay with that. And then without taking a breath, he just said, and mind you, I'm going to recruit 14 other All-Americans during your four years. Are you okay with that? And I said, yes, sir, bring them on. So I was pretty cocky. And uh, it was a done deal before I, the minute before he just walked in my house, he would have given me a pen. I would have signed my letter of intent and went to UCLA just because of him. Uh, now he was one of 125 scholarships that I had available. And coming from a, a uh, background of five children in one room, you can imagine getting a $200,000, $250,000 scholarship at that time was huge for our family to get, to get a college degree. But I did have a question for coach before he left. And I said, coach, I have one more question. He says, Raymond, we don't add or subtract from our letter of intent, but I'll listen to your question. I said, coach has nothing to do with basketball. I said, I'd like to play baseball while I'm at UCLA because I said, I love baseball. And my dad was a, a, a Milwaukee Brave with Hank Aaron and some of these great names. And I promised my, my dad I would always try to make it in baseball. He said, sure, after the final four. Final four is the NCAA championship. So he said I could play baseball. So I did. And it turned out I uh, had a great baseball career. I was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds in baseball and the Golden State Warriors in basketball. And when it came down to it, because I grew up with no money, I wanted to buy my mom a house. I decided to sign a basketball contract and get my mom and dad a five bedroom house. Wow, what a legendary story. First of all, athletes to be so good in both sports that are so completely different and excel at him and get scholarship, it's unheard of. Yeah, I mean, it was very you're fortunate. You're an absolute legend. You're an absolute legend and how much you developed your craft early on. I know it came a lot from pain and a lot from a, a desire to elevate not only yourself, but your family and your upbringing. And for many that don't know, your upbringing is also from Asia. You, you're connected to heritage from exactly where? Uh, Filipino. I'm, I'm, my mother's from uh, Taal Batangas in the Philippines. So when I got drafted, it wasn't a big deal back then, but because the game is so globalized now, and it's so commercialized in every country. Uh, heritage was not that big of a deal when I was growing up. Everybody was black. I had the big Afro. Everybody in my family's married black. We have blacks, we have whites, we have, we have a family. If you ever came to Isabel, I'm gonna invite you to a uh, family get together. It would be <laughs> an international, you would blend in fine because there's everything in our family at, this, uh, at these functions. But, uh, I didn't realize I was the first Filipino, uh, first Filipino player to be drafted and to ever play in the NBA. Now you have two other half black, half Filipinos. Uh, you have Jordan Clarkson was the second one who plays with the Utah Jazz. And just recently, um, I think uh, I was the first round pick in the NBA. I know Jordan was a high second round pick and I know Jalen Green was a, uh, the second pick, one of the highest picks ever in the NBA, and he's played with the Houston Rockets. So I'm very proud that for 38 years, I carried a torch that, that uh, nobody ever achieved. And now I pass it on to Jordan and Jalen, and they're doing a wonderful and an amazing job. They're wonderful and great athletes, and they represent the, the community well. Um, so I'm very proud to be of that heritage and to see two players, you know, speak so proudly about their own heritage. And, you know, I have so much to say about a lot of things because I think we live in a day and an age where kindness is needed and humility and, and graciousness and compassion. We live in this day of, of divided uh, heritages, divided ethnicities, divided race. And, uh, you know, I think all lives matter. It doesn't Absolutely. matter if you're Asian, you're Mexican, doesn't matter if you're European, it doesn't matter if you're Italian, doesn't matter if you're black, doesn't. I think every 
Life is precious. And I think we need to speak life into one another. We need to bring kindness back to this earth and get back to a place where we love not only one another, but we love each other's countries. We love our own country. Yes. So I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be, I'm not a political No, you're guy. doing phenomenal. I'm glad you're pointing that out because we need to, and that's the reason I mentioned heritage is more from connecting the dots, how you, yes, it's not difficult to have the representation in MBA. You were the first one, but look at what you did and how you carved path for others, as you just mentioned. But in the same time, how beautiful that is, the not stereotype to not just to say, you know, Filipinos are too short to know where they can play basketball and succeed, right? That is so many by and stigmas and when we take all of that down and eliminate what we have drive passion and deep desire to do the best you can right it's all about your heart and, and that blood that pop, pumps in it absolutely it and you're a living legend that really uh, definitely not only fulfill that for yourself but also for so many and i can't wait to dive in what are you currently doing but before we get there i mean you had a most an amazing coach of all times to recruit you in the legend in itself and i just love how you build a relationship and trust so quickly and how you said i was sold i was ready to sign off him because who he was do you mind sharing some experience and what was to be on UCLA and being coached under the name of the legend? You know, John Wooden um, has impacted so many of his players. And when we played for him, nobody understood. He would correct us and allow us to make choices and allow us to build and grow and progress at our own you know, rate in our own journey you never realized that he was building you up and, and having you grow as a man. But better yet, everything he said on the basketball floor had nothing to do with basketball. It was all about life. He just used the basketball court to teach you about life. Some of the things that he would always say is, you know, one of the greatest things a person can ever do in their life is to serve somebody that will never be able to repay you back. I think he says one of the greatest services that you can do in life is to serve someone that will never be able to pay you back. And I think that was, was something that stuck in my, my mind about what do I want to do after? Because I grew up with a mother, uh, a father who's a coach, but a mother who served everybody, would have given the shirt off her back, would have, it didn't matter what color you were, didn't matter what economic level you came from. My mother just wanted to help you have a bigger and better life. And uh, I, I, when I speak about my mother, I always, I'll try not to get choked up because I lost her about 16 years ago, but my mother, I live to carry on her legacy. I live to carry on Coach Wooden's legacy about serving. Uh, Coach Wooden was one of the most humble coaches. Uh, Whenever he got mad, he never cursed or swear. He was so classy. He would say, goodness gracious sakes alive. So whenever you heard, whenever you heard goodness gracious sakes alive, all the players would get really quiet because the next name that came after that phrase, you better pay attention because his next words could impact that practice, that week, that month, that year, your career, your life. That's how well honored and much respected he was not only in the game but as a man so whenever you heard goodness gracious sakes alive i know i still have ptsd because my name was after that one time in my career. <laughs> uh oh what did i do this time what did i miss <laughs> yeah. so uh you know from that standpoint he was a, a man who just lived a life of giving and serving a life of humility and He'd always say, never too high, never too low. And what he was talking about is we as people, we can never be too high in ourselves and we can never be so low we can't give back. Um, but everything he said, you know, about character, about uh, reputation, he used to say things like, uh, don't worry about what people think because your reputation is only about what they think and your character is who you really are. I mean, he had so many what we call woodenisms that I use today with young people and I've used uh, throughout. I knew my journey was going to be about serving people. So uh, since 1990, I think we've serviced over 33,000 children. 
uh, not just children, young people, but uh, not just athletes. I'm talking about special needs programs. And, um, it's always been about other people. And I think that my mother's spirit is, is in that. And I was never, I never felt I could ever do that because I just always asked God, I said, Lord, you know what I want to do? You know, my heart wants to give back. Just give me 60 kids. Give me 100 kids. And then all of a sudden it went to 60 in a year to 1200 a year to 4800 a year to and God just multiplied that. And the next thing you know, you know, now that I'm 65 years old and you look and you're saying, man, 33,000 children. I just came out of retirement to do something else, but it's a lot of families. And I know it wasn't me because there's no way I ever envisioned, nor I think it's just a heart that's willing to serve and a heart that's willing to become whatever somebody wants you to become to impact this world. I think it's about knowing, knowing that call and being diligent in your call and uh, getting knowledge to prepare for your call. It's not something you can just step into. I mean, Raymond, you blow my mind because I, I mean, how humble, genuine and approachable you are. But in the same time that, that this, your wisdoms, uh, uh, in addition to wisdoms you've been exposed obviously from your coach and, and others. Uh, and it is about servitude and giving back. Obviously you'll already accomplish living legacy and now you're leading legacy and legacy for others to obtain and giving back through much greater servitude, which we have the biggest deficit of leaders right now. And also role models, right? It's like, who do you role model after? If you look at it and if you don't see not only representation, but if you don't see something that you truly feel like, oh my goodness, this is what I inspire to be. And what a gift for those kids. So do you mind sharing a little bit about the programs? I know you said you mentioned you came out of the retirement and your passion is there. So what are you currently doing and, and, and how you are leveraging all the beautiful knowledge to make that impact? Well, I retired in 1990 and I know my, my goal was to become a pro golfer. <laughs> so, oh my God, so let's tackle another sport. <laughs> no. Well, I, you know what? I, I figured in 1990 when I retired, I needed something so athletes are wired differently, pro athletes especially. We have to master. We have to master whatever Conquer we're doing. Conquer another territory. <laughs> you know what? Mastering a skill and putting on all those hours to master it, though you may never master it, but the drive and the, to strive for perfection or to be the best you're capable of becoming. Um, you know, Coach Wooden used to say, you know, success is the direct result of a peace of mind of of achieving the result of becoming the best you're capable of becoming. Um, I think athletes are wired to be the best in everything they do. And, and not just the sport, because your strive for perfection in one thing, it makes you a great father. It makes you a great mother. It makes you a great attorney. It makes you a great grandfather. It makes you a great teacher. It makes you, because just understanding where greatness lies, it, it lies within you. And it can take you to spearhead anything you want to do because you know the recipe and how to get there. So I, I wanted to try golf. I did it for about four or five years. And then I was thinking, you know, Lord, I know there's more to me than just being a good golfer. I, I, there's so many people out there, you know, and I being of a foundational religious and spiritual upbringing and a good foundation of who Jesus Christ is and God I knew there was a bigger call in my life. And so I said, okay, Lord, I want to serve children, you know, open it up. Well, he threw me into the trenches and he said, oh, I've got just the job for you. And so I <laughs> went over to, to ask. <laughs> I, 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 yes, be careful. So I went over to this middle school on, in a lower, lower socioeconomic area of San Jose. And I went in and talked to the principal, told him who I was. He knew who I was. He said, Hey, are you sure you want this job? He goes, it's our PE program, but we need a head. He goes, we have 13 gangs here. He goes, we spend over $65,000 on paint just to paint the, the school every day because these gangs are tagging every day for their territory. We only have a 2% suit up ratio in PE. 
He goes, that means nobody's doing PE. And I said, well, PE is so important. It's, it's what, you know, the physical activity and the exertion and the things and the disciplines and the learning. I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And uh, I didn't realize uh, that was my furnace to get buttons pushed and to learn how to deal with uh, people who are not of the same mind and people who are hopeless. Some kids are in gangs they can't get out of. It gave me a whole new perspective, not just of what poverty is, but things that children are doing to get out of poverty and the struggles. And it gave me the perspective, the, per, the perspective of you can reach anybody. You just got to find the common ground. And with that comes the respect for one another. Now, you don't have to, you don't have to agree or, or in any way uh, support the activities of a person. Yes. But you need to respect their heart and their feelings and, and hear the way they are. And when I found out I had a gift for children, then it went from being in that district for about 10 years. Three years later, I was a PE uh, teacher of the year, uh, coach of the year for PE. I was the athletic. I mean, I did every I wore so many hats. And I just think once you start serving, there isn't enough that you can't do. Um, and after 10 years of, of being in that situation, God, you know, spoke to me about something else. So I was in that. And then I said, you know, Lord, you put me in this. I know there was a reason for it. What's my next journey? So 10 years later, he said, why don't you open up a special needs school? I said, Lord, I know nothing about special needs. He goes, open up a school. I'll open it up for you. I'll get the building. I'll get everything for you. I'll line the right people up. I'll give you the divine favor walk through the doors and serve my children. And I was like, Lord, what kind of children are you sending me? He says, oh, I'm going to get you emotionally disturbed, uh, other health impaired. I'm going to get you uh, uh, ADHD. I'm going to get you, uh, I'm going to get you uh, schizophrenic. I'm going to get you bipolar. I'm going to give you everything of the children who need, need you. And I said, well, what's the reason? He says, because these children have no fathers. Wow. And when I thought about that, I says, okay, you want me to, to live your life as the father to the children who don't have a role model. And did that for about 10 years, uh, 10,000 children. And I met so many young people that were labeled. They were given up on in the public school. And we brought them in and it got to a point where they found out what family truly is. The school was now their family. They had zero, you know, zero to 5% attendance ratios at our school. They were in the high nineties. They came to school every day. I even gotten close with the district attorney, the judge for family court. I showed up to all these children's court services. They allowed me to take a half a dozen kids out of juvenile hall every day bus them to our school from eight o'clock. They had to be back at juvenile hall by 4.30. But it, it gave me a whole nother perspective on a whole nother, uh, I don't want to say ch child, but a young person uh, who, who had no chances. And now that I'm older and I run into some of these kids, it's so funny, they give me a hug and they said, we, we never used Mr. Towns and it was always Raymond, you know, in that environment, we want people to call you by your first name where I've been always brought up that anybody older than you call Mr. But I'd always hear in, in the middle of a mall the other day, Raymond, I turn around, one of my students comes up, gives me a big old hug and she has five little ones. I said, oh, you didn't listen to my, my celibacy talks that I used to give when I was in school. She goes, you know, all those things you used to tell me and all those little phrases, I say those to my kids. She goes, I tell my kids all the time. Oh, so amazing. though we serve, we never know the impact we're making and the impact may not be immediate because a lot of those children graduated from our school. Some kids threw absolute fits when a district came in because we were getting their money and now that they're going to school all the time, it was they wanted to take them back. Some of our kids ended up throwing chairs and meetings against the walls because they said no 
this is my family. You did nothing for me as a public school district. I am thriving here. And now because I'm successful, you want to take me to a place I'm unsafe. These kids learned how to have a voice for something right instead of having a voice for something wrong. Um, but you never know how you're going to impact society or community or a person. You never know. And it may not show itself for five or 10 years later, but just planting the seed is enough to make it grow. So, that is outstanding, Raymond. Uh, I just love how intentional everything about you and how connected you are with your spirit, mind, and body, how aware of you are. And then, as you said, like you were retired, you didn't have to, you didn't need to, but you chose to. And then you're doing, obviously, as a result, spectacular, amazing work. And knowing demographics you're talking about and work that I've been doing also on and off, and then seeing a lot of these cases in court, uh, where I'm used in different capacities as well, it's heart wrenching, it's heartbreaking, and it's also showing when we don't see the value, when we lose the value in human being, people shut down, and specifically kids, they can feel when they're not wanted, when they're not respected, when they're not desired, when they're seen as a failure, and when they're completely being ostracized. And and I just want to say I, I am beyond grateful for people like yourself and and for someone who not only know how to do that very well but recognizes what is needed so based on this and you said ripple effect doesn't come always necessarily very quickly generationally and and that is such a powerful truth Again, as I mentioned, you're on the Legacy Leader Show. We're talking about your amazing legacy. Not only do you living right now, that you're also leading. Because so many people focus, what do I leave behind when I'm one day gone? And, and it's like, wait a second, what are you doing right now? What can you do more? And you're a perfect example of that. So with that in mind, uh, obviously with children, with the programs and everything, where the biggest needs are right now for everybody watching, listening, that wants to get involved, that is curious, uh, or, or companies that we, we, we definitely put in this in front of, what are the biggest needs and where do you feel like the biggest opportunity for others to help you on this journey? Um, you know, I, I think there's been a, uh, a pedestal to speak out about some of the things that are going on right now in our country. Um, I, I promised I would never be political, but uh, lately with the new uh, critical race theory, and you know, I have grandchildren who are 10 and 11 that live with me. Um, my two grandchildren, uh, they're having, we're having more racial ethnic conversations about racism and words that are being thrown around. And I know with this, this big conflict of what we're learning, uh, I would, like to see more people get involved with educating people about some of these, you know, equity and equality programs that we're trying to, to raise our children. And my little 10 year old Sienna came home the other day and she said, you know, Papa, can I talk to you about something? I said, sure, baby, what's up? She said, you know, Papa, I had this girl call me this name and I told her I thought that was a racist comment. And I said what she said, she told me what she said. And she goes, is that a racist comment? I said, yeah, it is, honey. She goes, I said, how did you answer her? I said, you didn't threaten her, did you? She goes, no. I said, what'd you say? She goes, I told her that I don't see color because we have black, white, we have everything in our family. So I don't know what color is. She goes, I told her that, that I love all my family no matter what color they are. So I didn't understand what she was saying, but she said, I know I'm not a racist and I know I don't see color. Um, and I told her I was so proud of her. I gave her a big hug and I said, that's the perfect answer. I said, you know, don't ever tell people who say those things how ignorant they are, but that's ignorance bearing its face to you. They haven't been educated about. I said, you're very fortunate. You live in an environment that has everything in it. Uh, we go to our family. We just had a Thanksgiving. You know, we have black families, white families. We have Filipino families. We had Mexican Filipinos. I said, black Filipino, you are so fortunate to have everything. And, you know, you're half black and half Mexican and Puerto Rican, you know, with some Filipino in you. You have everything in you. So 
you're you're fortunate to be like that. It's exotic. It's 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 beautiful, and you have to see yourself as amazing and beautiful. And there's going to be people out there who try to steal, you know, and speak death over us. You have to understand who's speaking death over you and who's speaking life into you. And the people speaking death into you, you need to cut off. And the people who speak life into you, keep them near you. Because those are the people who are going to bring out the amazing attributes and talents in you that are going to make you successful and great. So, but, you know, I, I'd like to see more programs and more parents and more people getting involved in understanding what's being put into our children, what's, what they're being indoctrinated with, because it's, it's dividing our country. It's dividing our people. Yes. And I experienced that firsthand when we didn't have a many actual different colors, but in former Yugoslavia, war, war genocide, and, and torture. Uh, and when you look at, we were all white, yet we come from all the tribes and we know how close interconnected we are. And all of a sudden, how narratives of religion is used to divide and conquer. And that is exactly what I'm seeing and witnessing here, how we're using these narratives to divide and conquer because of sense of fear or a need for control because we don't feel like it's enough and plenty for everyone and then creating all these artificial standards who is more to be respected who is the most uh important race and and who is secondary and tertiary who gets scholarship who doesn't who gets approved and doesn't get approved i mean all of those things that became so insanely over exposing on something that again is removing us which is we're all human race right yes yes and, and you know the other thing is i'd love to see more foreigners who've come to america for great reason and have become so successful because of the freedom and the democracy and the the opportunity to become entrepreneurs and such as yourself who do great things for America. I'd love to see more people share their struggle to come over here and to tell what they experienced and where America's headed if we don't stand up and, 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 and make a change. And do you mind sharing, since we're touching this a little bit, obviously after MBA, you went to play in Europe. And in that time was no many black or Filipino or you name it, any other ethnic groups, really. I remember like I traveled through Europe, I saw one black person till I went to refugees camps and I was uh, uh, in political asylum in refugee camps in Sweden. Then I started seeing all these ethnic representation from Asia, Middle East, uh, Africa specifically. You couldn't really see many representations of anything else than the Caucasians, really. So how right. was your experience at that time? And then how my people treated you? Because you play against Yugoslavia in basketball, because you play for Spain, <laughs> play for Italy. So please tell us a little bit about that. Um, you want the good part or the bad part? <laughs> I want to both. Because that is, but that is reality, right? I really want to both because I want it because that is showing how certain things either changing or not changing and where are we at and how we need to raise our consciousness. You know, uh, it was it was a great experience. One of the greatest experience was traveling overseas because I love learning and not only learning about other cultures, but learning how to immerse yourself into another people, into another culture. So I was very uh, educated about, uh, I was really hungry and had a desire to learn that person's language. I felt if I could communicate in your language as a foreigner, it would show that I'm sincere about honoring your culture and, and respecting your country. Uh, so when I was in Brazil, I picked up Brasileiro or, or Brazilian Portuguese. And when I was in Barcelona, it was, you know, Spanish. When I was in Italy, because I took so many Spanish classes when I was young, I was took five years in a four-year high school. I was a fifth-year Spanish student. Once you get a Latin language, a foundation of it, the conjugations, the verbs, the words, they're very similar. All you got to do is learn the accent. Um, <laughs> but I remember traveling to all these different countries because, you know, uh, back in the day, Croatia, Yugoslavia, you know, it was a, it's a different dialect. 
I mean, and I dated a Russian woman for about a year and a half and picked up a little bit of Russian, but it's a different dialect. And, you know, I, I would have loved to been there long enough, but we were only there for three or four days and then we'd go away. And then, um, you know, I was all over in Italy for two years. So I got over there a number of times, but it was, uh, they didn't like, they put it this way. They didn't like Americans because of the competition, not because we were American. They didn't like it because, so what you have to understand about NBA players, NBA players play in the NBA. And then when you feel the opportunity to make more money, you usually will go to Europe and, and make money there. So for a lot of players, Europe was either at the end of their career or in the middle of their career. But after, you know, they either played in America before they went to Europe. And I remember there was a lot during the European Cup, especially because you being from Croatia, you know, the European Cup in football, not American football, but football. It is a crazy environment. So was the European Cup in basketball. And yeah. I remember we went to, you know, the Italians and the, the Israelis had a horrible history. Well, whenever we go to the European Cup, you would see the second or third level. You'd see Italian flags and Jewish flags hitting each other. You know, it was just it was like crazy environment for for that. And I remember it was in Croatia. I remember the third quarter we were playing in Yugoslavia and it was a good, good team. But I remember in the third quarter, I remember something hit me on my head. And all I remember is I just blood poured out because this is a sensitive area. So somebody threw and I looked down and there was a size D battery spinning. So oh. somebody threw a battery, hit me and oh. Sorry. You know, and I, no, no, it, ha it happened. But I remember I was holding my head and the Italians are so dramatic. They're like, no, no, let it bleed. We want the world to see. And I said, no, I'm not going to let it bleed. So I had to go in halftime. They stitched me up. I had 11 stitches and then I came back out and played like, I don't know, eight minutes later. But uh, it's very intense, very intense. Uh, that's not even saying anything bad about any any uh, ethnicity or country. It's just, that's how competitive it was. I mean, you remember in the, the uh, European Cup in London, remember they stormed and a lot of people died over the fences. It was yes. a team from London and somebody. It's just people are very passionate about their sports over there. Um, but for me, yes. I, think, I think traveling to Europe, I think made me the man I am today. Because there was a lot of, wonderful, wonderful people I met in every country, a lot of wonderful players that when they come over here, you didn't realize, you know, like the Petrovic, Jawson, great man, uh, great young man, uh, tragedy, how he, he, he lost his life. One of the, probably one of the greatest basketball players to ever come out of Europe and immerse himself in the NBA and, and do great things for Yugoslavia and Croatia. I mean, when you mentioned Croatian basketball, it's the first name you mentioned, yes. you know, he was that great of a player. Um, my experiences overseas with the foods, the people, the architecture, the history, I didn't just go over there to play basketball. I wanted to learn everything. So when I had two or three days off, when I was in Italy, I was in another city watching, looking, you know, standing on a ground that's a famous, you know, sacred ground of something that happened, you know, in, in history. So I was one of those kind of people. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the Slavic beaches, you know, some of those beaches, there's no comparison in the world. So, yes, I was one of those guys. I mean, we had our stories. I remember when I was in Israel, I never understood this, but I later I did because I always often wonder what God felt like or what Jesus Christ felt like carrying his cross and having people, you know, treat him the way they did when he was going to be sacrificed. and uh not even sacrificed he was going to be uh crucified crucified yes my my age coming oh, no, out you're what doing great. but i was all i was never could understand and i remember walking through we were playing against maccabi tel aviv and i was walking through the tunnel and i could never understand why their tunnel is really big and our tunnel was like about four feet wide and it was really low and i remember walking through that tunnel 
and people just spit on us. Literally, you walk through the tunnel through the halftime and people just spit. And and I didn't understand because it was my first time to Maccabi. I didn't understand why my players had towels over their heads walking out. Well, later I found out because when I walked into the locker room and looked in the mirror and I had just stuff all over me, the first thing that came into my spirit was, wow, that's what Jesus felt like. When people, when he was going to be crucified, I never understood why I had to go through that, but it gave me a whole different perspective of what he felt like when he was giving his life for us and people were spitting on him and throwing things at him and doing some of these things. And trust me, I put on a towel every time I went back to Maccabi, I had a towel over <laughs> my head and I was safe, but it was just the passion and the history of, of, you know, of a country and two countries and I remember when when uh, Maccabi came to, to Italy, there were fights in the second row or the second tier. We had three tiers. We had a very nice stadium that they used for the Olympics, you know, back in, in Rome that we played in called Pala Eur. And uh, I remember there were major fights during our games whenever Israel and, and, and Italy got together. I mean, we had to stop the game for two or three minutes and they had police pulling people off each other. So. It's just a passionate sport back over there. It's almost like the days of the gladiators. You know, <laughs> if I had to compare it, you know, those days yes. of the gladiators, but yes. two great champions coming together and people coming together just for the view of the competition. And, uh, but you know what? Greatest, greatest part of my life was being over in Europe for seven, eight years. Uh, if, if I could ever talk to young people and let them know you need to go and live in another country, it doesn't matter what country, you will grow as a person and, and uh, will be a forever memory, you know, meeting the people and the culture and, and, and the way life is in another country and will make you be so grateful to be a part of America. Such a words of this, and I, I, I just like how you intentionally did, how you figure it out, and how you did it the best thing you could do. And and so many people travel; they always say we can't learn another language. We're not wired that way. And I'm like, look at this, and and that is that it's just an amazing compliment because you maximize every opportunity you got and exposure. And I feel like that is such a rich life. And as a result, you've made amazing accomplishments. So everybody watching and listening, that is how is a legend created. That, that legends are not being born, they're being made. And you are absolutely perfect example of that. Thank you. Oh my goodness. And you, how many languages do you speak, five or six? Uh, I only speak Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, I, I butcher French with an Italian accent and then English. And I'm learning right now, I'm learning my mom would be so mad at me. I'm just learning Tagalog right now because I, I have to go back to the Philippines with the NBA Asia tour and speak nice. to people because I have family in the Philippines, but I don't speak Tagalog. So I'm actually learning Tagalog for the first time, not living over there, but learning it from a program and picking it up. And, you know, it's Spanish based, so I should be able to pick it up. But I'm that getting ready. Brilliant. So uh, when I go back there, you know, uh, Filipinos are funny. They speak with, with half English, half half Tagalog or Ilocano, <laughs> or you know, there's different dialects, but they speak half and half. So I'm trying to learn when to mix in my English words with my Filipino, and but they <laughs> they flow in it, and it's a wonderful country. I've been back there three or four times, but they want to do a tour to introduce me to the people officially as the first Filipino in the NBA, and so. Uh, I'm learning Tagalog. My mom, like I said, she's probably turning over in her grave, you know. <laughs> but I'm sure she's very proud of you because you are trying, you're going to be addressing your people in native language. And I just love about you how approachable, again, you are down to earth and how you're able to connect to anyone. And that is the beauty. I don't see that arrogance and entitlement and all of those things that a lot of times people, when they accomplish some success, start changing their makeup and their DNA and what they're all about. And contrary, you just continue shining and showing how what it really does matter. With that in mind, obviously, you have the living legend. You already have a living legacy. You're leading the legacy. So what's left in the bucket list? Come on, tell us. Um, well, to? you know what? After, after doing all the education with special needs and, and serving at that point, it was probably 
23,000 children for basketball and probably another 10,000 in, in special needs and education. You know, I, I got to a point where I said, Lord, I've, I've done everything you've asked. I really just want to do basketball. Yeah. So he goes, okay, I'm going to get you some of these players. And what you do to get back is help them get D1 scholarships, get them D2 scholarships, D3 scholarships, NAIA, get them uh, opportunities to play pro. You speak four languages, get them overseas, the ones who aren't good enough to play in the NBA, get the other ones in the G League, get the NBA players that you can train. So the last, I'd say, seven or eight years, that's all I've done. Um, I don't have to work. I get paid by the NBA the rest of my life. So I'm just, I, I'm training players, uh, young players who I have many kids who are out there who have scholarships for getting their college educations through basketball. Um, I have a very good reputation in the area about being one of the best trainers. I've been doing that for about eight years. And then I, I got an opportunity. I haven't really coached since the nineties. And I got this opportunity and it's one of the best leagues in Northern California. And I prayed about it because I know it's a lot of work. It's a program that hasn't won in over 18 years. They play one of the best leagues. They're one of the last place teams every year. Uh, no disrespect to my own you know, school, but it's something I think needed a, a change of culture, a change of vision. Uh, the program needs to be a standard. And, and I think when I prayed about this, you know, I, I never understood the ramifications. You know, a man had a vision and built a Christian school on top of the hill overlooks the whole city. Well, you know, we're supposed to be the standard. We're supposed to be that light shining and beaming on a, on a hill, you know, showing people what this is. And I, I said, Lord, you know, you got the most beautiful facility and the resources. It's got the greatest academic programs. It's got a college-like campus for a high school. It's got a middle school on campus. It's large and then a high school campus. So you're dealing with a lot of children. I said, I just don't understand why you want me to go to a place that's never won. You know, that's never, ever. He says, you need to go. You know, and I've been there now. I got hired late. I was hired in September. Most coaches get hired in April. So I didn't have a whole lot of time and uh, brought in a few, you know, uh, went out and, and had a few players that were interested wherever they found out I was coaching again and players. I had about 12 transfers try to get in. I took four of them and uh, it's been a special journey. And what I'm realizing is even though it's a Christian school, there's still a lot of of needs, emotional needs yes. that need to be met. Uh, just because it's a Christian school doesn't mean that kids who are come from Christian families don't have emotional setbacks or situations. And what I've learned is this isn't even about basketball. It's about like Coach Wood. It's about teaching life to young, to young men, helping them become better men. Uh, making their lives bigger and better and basketball just being the vehicle that I'm going to use it with. And, and then when I was there, God just said, you know what, you haven't done these things since 1990, but I want you to start a community outreach through basketball. I want you to, so I have all these things that God's put on my plate. And so I took the job and it's been a wonderful journey. I have wonderful young men. I'm in charge of 15 young men that are just the greatest young men. And uh, I, I feel that all my work with Coach Wooden and all my basketball that I've done throughout my life is now coming to fruition in this school. And we are gonna make a change and we will become a major high school, not only in the state, but nationally. Um, I, I believe that the vision that God gave me is imparted into me, it will, will, will come to fruition quickly. It won't be a 10 year deal. It's going to come quickly. Um, Speed is amazing and important when it's all specifically around done right, right? Exactly. So I took this job and I'm still training high end players in the off season. Uh, I still stay involved with Filipino Heritage Night in the NBA. Uh, 
Um, got one coming up with Golden State. I got a Houston. I have Toronto. So I'm still uh, going to a lot of these functions, uh, you know, to not only promote my heritage, but just to, I love seeing old friends that I haven't seen and we've <laughs> aged. And luckily for me, I'm still my playing weight. So I could go out there. <laughs> I always uh, athlete I'll, I'll, for life. That is amazing. Yes, yes. For, uh, those are very rare. So six four, 195 pounds. I'm still, you know, okay. And and but it's really good to see my friends. Um and and the great ones, the Hall of Famers. I was never a Hall of Famer, but to see not you know, yet. That doesn't mean you will not be. Well, I'm I, you know, I'm in the San Jose City Hall of Fame, the San Jose Hall of Fame, but and, and I don't, you know. I don't do things for for those reasons. I think I know. my crown is is sitting in another place, and you know I'll I'll treasure the day I get to see my mom and dad again and give them a hug, you know, up in his kingdom. But uh, you know I do things for his glory, not for my own. And uh, I don't need trophies, and I don't need. And any that's of that. why you're so successful because you're unselfish and selfless, and you do it from the right reason. And but when everything now we sum, I mean, you accomplished so much that multiple, multiple people never will do it in their lifetime. Uh, could you please just tell us what would be ultimately something you want to be remembered by? Because obviously your wisdoms are going to be carried on to generations to come. Your legacy is going to be affecting generations and generations. But ultimately, what do you feel the most proud of uh, based on all the world work, wisdom, upbringing, and everything you've been and done? I think the biggest thing I want to be remembered for was whether I was in front of you for a day, a week, a month, a year, a season. Um, I want to be remembered that I was a man that made such an impact in your life that you'll be remembered forever. And not just remembered for me, but what I, what I gave back to you that propelled you to give back to somebody else. I think that's what it's all about. It's it's not about who we serve. It's who we're going to serve that's going to turn around and serve somebody else with those same principles. So I think that's something that I'd like to go out on. And and you know we're we're doing things that are going to last forever, regardless. Um, I I do a lot of this because I want my grandchildren and my children my children and my grandchildren and both of my children like my eldest daughter Rochelle and my youngest daughter Christiara they're 38 and 31 uh they're my greatest accomplishments my two daughters I mean and I've done lots in my life but these two are my greatest accomplishments my eldest is uh she's a clinical director she was pre-law but then she worked in, in, in dad's school with special needs kids and she changed over to child psychology. Now she's a clinical director for families who are uh, at risk and they got uh, sexual, domestic violence, sexual abuse. She is helping people cope to get through life in some of the most tragic and, and you know, uh, tough hurdles that they have to overcome so she does that so she kind of took on dad's spirit about serving the world my youngest is now after she just got divorced she's back in school to get her degree uh wonderful heart and i always tell her i said you know i love you to death but you're taking the polar route you know you're taking the polar route to get things done but uh I'm glad that God finally has got you on the right track and 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 done that. But my two girls, uh, my youngest has my 10 and 11 year old, uh, and my eldest has a four and a newborn, uh, Luca and Ella. Luca and Ella, uh, four. Luca's four. Ella's like five months, six months, and then I got D'Angelo at 11 and Sienna at 10. So. Besides everything that I do, I mean, those are some of the most important people in my life that I will always be there for. So my life is full. It's blessed. I just uh, would like to share that you can impact anybody in this world as long as you're open to doing it. 
if you're open to really serving somebody and seeing the best come out of people, there's a lot of hurting people in this world, especially during the pandemic. There's a lot of mental illness, a lot of depression. There's a lot of anger management issues going on right now. We live in a world where there's such rage that, you know, things that are going on, you know, when we grew up, and I'm a lot older than you, but when we grew up, you never think of having or seeing. It's happening right before our eyes. So it's a lot of hurting people out there. Um, it is, it is. And we have to demonstrate that we care and what is alternative, that they have someone that they can talk to and someone that they also truly, generally is interested in their well-being. And, perfect. And you, and obviously your daughter is doing a phenomenal job of making that happen. Because when, when you work with people that don't have resources and don't have any other ways to be, it's, exactly. it's the saddest, saddest thing to witness. And, it, and, and you are changing that so beautifully. So first of all, I wanted just to thank you for your time and opportunity to have with you here at Legacy Leader Show to share your journey. And we'll definitely have you back. And I'm super excited with everything you just shared, how many beautiful things are coming up also that you also still don't know about in 2020 to and beyond so it's just super exciting for everyone watching and listening what can you do to step in step up your game and follow what raymond is doing and also what is the best way for them to get engaged or donate or support or just simply learn from the programs you've been involved how can we support you well you know uh, i tell you i i'm always looking for support in everything we do um I've been blessed. Uh, when God gives you divine favor, he sends the right people into your life, whether you need money, whether you need resources, whether you need gymnasiums, whether you need, you know, he sends the right people. So I think everything's divinely timed. I think his, God's will and his timing is always perfect. Um, but I'm always looking for programs that can, can outreach to the, the people in a lower poverty, lower socioeconomic area to give them the same opportunities as other people have. So I'm always looking for that kind of, of support to give those kind of children the same opportunity. What we do is we scholarship a lot of young people into our program because they don't have the resources. And you know, as long as they keep our standards of, of protocol and procedures and respect and honor for one another, then I'm good with them staying with us for free. Um, I'm uh, I'm looking for those kind of that kind of support, um, just something I can give back to other people who don't have. That's beautiful. Okay, then we'll definitely look at that. And for people to find you on the social media, uh, they can also find you on LinkedIn, right? And then Facebook, yes. and uh, you're very active, different programs. And I will have a couple of links so that they can get in direct in touch with you as well. Wonderful. Isabella, I've always looked forward to talking to you. I, I listen to a lot of your posts and I just want to thank you. I'm so grateful for you to invite me to your program and thank you for your much needed and uh, your service to, to make everybody's life better. You, you, you make this world better. You're an amazing person. I thank you very much for your spirit and just your commitment to your vision and what you're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Legacy Leader Show. If you enjoyed the content and had a positive experience, then please leave us a positive rating. In addition, leave us positive review whenever you are listening on whatever platform there might be. Make sure your friends and family also know about the benefit and value that we provide and what we have to offer. Cheers.